The city of Jerusalem is mentioned in numerous places in the Bible, from the, from the early pages of Genesis right through to the penultimate chapters in the book of Revelation. In fact, over 60% of the books of the Bible talk about Jerusalem in some form or other. So I think just from those facts alone, you can see that Jerusalem plays a very important part in the Holy Scriptures. And that's what we're going to look at uh, this evening. Uh, we'll start, uh, God willing, by looking at some of the history of Jerusalem. And then we'll soon see that God has a very special relationship with that city, which we'll uh, look at a little bit. And we'll also look at a number of prophecies that the Bible includes, some that have already taken place and some that are still to be fulfilled in the future. So we'll look at some of those. And we'll see as part of that that, that Jerusalem has a part to play long into the future as well. And we'll explore what that is. And then finally we'll, we'll bring this home because what we'll see as we go through is that it becomes a subject that is very personal to every one of us or will be very personal to each one of us in the future. Uh, and we'll end by looking at that. So let's start then by looking at some of the history of the city of Jerusalem. And we'll start by going back to uh, some of the very early pages of our Bibles in Genesis, when Jerusalem was a Canaanite city. Canaan, that was the name of, of the land at that time, and Canaanites were the people who lived there. If you have a, a, a Bible with you and you'd like to come with me, um, we go to Genesis chapter 14. So this is the first time the city of Jerusalem is mentioned in the Bible. It's in the time of Abraham. Now, what's happened here, his, his nephew has been taken captive by some attacking armies. Abraham has gone after those armies, and he's overthrown them, and he's brought back his nephew Lot. And on his way back from that victory, he's met uh, by a king. Uh, let's go in at verse 18, Genesis 14. Then Melchizedek... <coughs> King of Salem. Salem, that's the old word for Jerusalem. So here we are. Melchizedek, king of Jerusalem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God Most High, and he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he gave him a tithe of all. Now, the New Testament looks back on that event when Abraham met this king Melchizedek and it's, it's quite a long and sort of deep theological argument. We're not going to look at it in detail. Let me just quickly read to you um, this passage a bit from Hebrews chapter 7. Uh, don't worry about the detail, just look at this sort of top level message of what it tells us. This Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all. So that's what we've just read. First being translated king of righteousness, then also king of Salem, which means king of peace, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the son of God, remains a priest continually. Therefore, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should arise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be called according to the order of Aaron? For the priesthood being changed of necessity is also a change of the law. So uh, quite a complicated theological argument. We're not going to go into the details of that. All I want to point out is that the New Testament looks back to the first time we came across Jerusalem and it says it's very significant. And it, and it emphasises for us about the meaning of Jerusalem. So the king who came to meet him was the king of peace. Jerusalem is described as the city of peace. And here the writer of the Hebrews is telling us this is very symbolic. It even links it to the son of God and the priesthood. Okay? So very first time here, time I came across Jerusalem, there's a lot of symbology going on. And we'll see some more of that in a minute. Second time we come across the city of Jerusalem, is when the people are led by Joshua and they go over the Jordan and they go into the land of Israel and start to capture the cities. Now, if you come with me to Joshua chapter 15, we we'll see that when they capture all the other cities, they don't succeed in capturing Jerusalem, the city of peace. So if you look at Joshua chapter 15, 
and <clears throat> look at verse 63. So it's in the, from, ver, from about verse 20, it's listed all the, all the cities that they've captured and, and started to take possession of. Verse 63, as for the Jebusites, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the children of Judah could not drive them out, but the Jebusites dwell with the children of Israel at Jerusalem to this day. So here we're up into Joshua's time. Children of Israel still do not occupy fully the city of Jerusalem. They, they couldn't throw out its inhabitants. Now if we go on to the time of the Judges and chapter 1, uh, we see there after Joshua's death, they have another go at Jerusalem, a little more successfully this time. The Judges 1 and verse 8. Now the children of Judah fought against Jerusalem and took it and struck it with the edge of the sword and set the city on fire. So they've captured the city at this point, but it appears that they did not actually inhabit it. And it quickly goes back to being a Jebusite city. The, the people of the land go, simply go back in again. And we know that because if you go on to chapter 19, and we'll see here that um, they're back in, the Canaanites are back in the city of Jerusalem and Israel does still not really own the city. Now, Leviticus 19 is a story about a Levite. Um, he's on a journey, coming back with his servant, and it's getting dark, and they're coming past Jerusalem as it starts to get dark. Uh, look at what he says about it in verse 10. However, the man was not willing to spend that, to spend that night, so he rose and departed and came to opposite Jabus, that is, Jerusalem. With him were the two saddled donkeys. <coughs> His concubine was also with him. They were near Jabus, and the, ser and the day was far spent. And the servant said to his master, Come, please, let's turn aside into the city of the Jebusites to lodge in it. But his master said to him, We will not turn aside here into a city of foreigners who are not of the children of Israel. We will go on to Gibeon. So here, in Judges 19, we see it's still not an Israelite city. Okay? And in fact, it's only when we come to the time of King David that it finally comes to be owned by the, <clears throat> by the children of Israel. Now, David had two encounters with Jerusalem. The first one was before he was a king. You remember when he fought, uh, fought their great warrior, Goliath. And remember at the end of that, of that battle, he, David cuts off uh, Goliath's head. Now, what does he do with it? Remember what he does with the head once he's cut it off? <coughs> Well, if you come with me to uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17, you'll see that David took the head and he carries it and he goes over to Jerusalem. 1 Samuel 17, if you look at verse 54. <coughs> then David took the head of the Philistine and he brought it to Jerusalem but put his armour in his tent. So he goes there, it's still a, a Jebusite city at this time, and you can imagine David standing there at the gates of the city holding the head of Goliath um, above his head, saying, you know, this is what I've done to your great warrior, and I want to come back and do the same to you, right? The sort of I'll be back kind of message to the people of the city. And sometimes later, when he is king, he comes back again to the city and fulfills his threat. So if you go on to 1 Chronicles 11, and we can see there that David, after he's been throned, comes back and fulfills his threat and captures the city of Jerusalem. So 1 Chronicles 11, verse 4. <clears throat> and David and all Israel went to Jerusalem, which is Jabus, where the Jebusites were, the inhabitants of the land. The inhabitants of Jabus said to David, you shall not come in here. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion, that is the city of David. And David said, whoever attacks the Jebusites first shall be chief and captain. And Joab, the son of Zeruiah, went up first and became chief. Then David dwelt in the stronghold, therefore they called it the city of David. So, here at last, only when we come to the time when David is king, does the city of peace finally become owned by the children of Israel. David repairs it, 
and it becomes known, as we were told there, as the City of David or the Old City. Now, note that because that is very important a bit later, as, as we'll see. So remember then, when David finally has the city, it, it's called either the Old City or the City of David. Now, let's leave the history of Jerusalem there for a moment, and let's look now at the history of a place called Mount Moriah. And you'll see in a moment why this is relevant. So what we'll do again, we'll, we'll go back to the early pages of, of Genesis and look at some of the history of Mount Moriah. And the first time it comes up again is in the time of Abraham. If you come with me to Genesis 22. And we see here that this is the place where Abraham was sent to sacrifice his son. First couple of verses of Genesis 22. Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. Then he said, take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. And we know the story, don't we? Abraham does as he's told. He goes to Mount Moriah. He takes his son with him and he, he prepares to sacrifice him. And he's, he's there with the sort of dagger raised above his son, ready to kill him. And God sends an angel and says, stop, don't kill him. I see now that you'll do as, do as I ask you. And God provides a ram that Abraham was unable to sacrifice instead. And do you see all the, all the fantastic symbology we have there? Abraham's son, his only son, his son who was born through a miracle, who was taken to Mount Moriah to be sacrificed. Again, just as with Jerusalem, we have all the symbology there. This time looking forward to when God would allow his son, his only son, born through a miracle, to be sacrificed. Okay, so again, a lot of symbology when we first come across Mount Moriah. Now the next time is a bit later. Again, it comes up in the time of David. Now David, at one point in his, his rule, made an enormous error of judgment. And God brought punishment on the children of Israel because of that, and a plague swept across the land. And the place where that plague stopped was at a place called the threshing floor of Ornan. Now, at the time, we don't re- we're not really told where that is. We're told that God stopped, that um, David made a sacrifice at this point where the plague was stopped. And we're told it was owned by Ornan, who was called the Jebusite. So we know he's in that part, same part of the country, but we don't know exactly where that is. Uh, in a moment, uh, you'll see we find, find later on where it is. The next time Mount Moriah comes up is in the time of David's son, Solomon. If you come with me to 2 Chronicles at uh, chapter 3, uh, we'll see that this is the point where Samuel, uh, sorry, where Solomon built the temple. So 2 Chronicles and chapter 3. Now Solomon began to build the house of the Lord at Jerusalem. Where did he build it? On Mount Moriah. Look what the writer adds here. Where the Lord had appeared to his father David at the place that David had prepared on the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. Okay, so we're told that not only was Mount Moriah the place where Abraham, in effect, sacrificed his son, we're told it's also the place where David made a sacrifice to God to thank him for stopping the plague. It's also the point where Solomon builds the temple to the Lord. Now, many historians also put forward evidence to suggest that Golgotha, where, of course, Jesus was crucified, was also on Mount Moriah. Although I'm not sure that evidence is, is, is totally uh, um, agreed upon. But a lot of historians put forward that argument that that is the place where Jesus was crucified. So really what we very much see here is that Mount Moriah has a very important history of great sacrifices right back to the time of Abraham. Okay, so that's the history of Mount Moriah, but where is it? Well, you'll see in a moment that the relevance to tonight's talk. Here's a sort of sketch map of the area, and in particular there's, there's three, here, three mountains, uh, really, that we'll look at. Now, I don't know how well you can see the picture in the top right-hand corner, but what you can see is that area, when we talk about mountains, these are not great 
pointy mountains with snow on the top like we see in Europe. They're more sort of rounded hills. Okay. And, and there's three in particular. Mount Zion is that one just there. Then this is Mount Moriah that we've just been talking about next to it. And the other one uh, important is the Mount of Olives, which is just on that side of the Valley of Jehoshaphat. Now, the city of David, then, the original Jabus, that's uh, roughly there uh, on, the, on the foot of, of Mount Zion. Okay, so when we're talking about the, the city that David captured, it's that bit there. Now, Solomon extended the walls of that city further. He extended them there when he built the temple. So now we're, now we're up to this area here. And then in the time of Nehemiah, Nehemiah extended out the back there, and the whole of this area, uh, then encompassing Mount Zion as well, is what's known as, as the Jerusalem. It's kind of the area that, rough the sprawl that we have these days of Jerusalem. So when the Bible talks about Mount Zion or Mount Moriah or Jerusalem, it's all that area here uh, that we're talking about. Okay? So you can see why Mount Moriah is kind of so much intertwined with the history of Jerusalem as well. Uh, they're, they're very much uh, one and the same thing. And what we see in the page of the Bible is that God has a very special relationship with this city of Jerusalem. Let me put a few passages up on here on the screen for you. Back in Kings, we read, Jerusalem, the city which the Lord has chosen out of all the tribes of Israel to put his name there. In the Psalms, we're told this is the mountain which God desires to dwell in. Yes, the Lord will dwell in it forever. In Chronicles, we're told that in Jerusalem shall my name be forever. And that's God speaking. And then in Psalm 132, the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his dwelling place. This is my resting place forever. Here I will dwell, for I have desired it, says God. All right, so we can see God has, a, has very special feelings about the city of Jerusalem. Let's just look at some of the phrases there. In Jerusalem shall my name be forever. God will dwell in it forever. This will be my resting place forever. Okay, so we see that not only has God had a special relationship with it in the past, but God is saying this special relationship is going to continue forever into the future okay and therefore it's not surprising is it that the Bible has a lot of prophecies about Jerusalem we're going to look at, at three we'll look at one about the ownership of Jerusalem we will look at what the prophecies talk about what will happen in Jerusalem when Jesus Christ comes back and we'll look at Jerusalem for the long-term future because okay, so they're the three that we'll look at God willing this evening and we're going to be quite brief on those the first one I want to talk about then is the ownership of the Jews by the Gentiles. And I want to introduce this by taking you to some words of Jesus in Luke 21. This is what Jesus said to his disciples about uh, what would happen to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. He said that they would fall by the edge of the sword, be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trampled by Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. So what Jerusalem, what um, Jesus is saying about Jerusalem, is that the time is going to come after, uh, shortly afterwards, that the Jerusalem is going to be attacked, uh, that the people are going to either be led away or killed by the sword. And of course, that started to be happen in AD 70, didn't it, when the Romans uh, came down and attacked uh, the city of Jerusalem. But in particular, what I want to, want to note is Jesus' phrase here about the time oh, sorry, about the times of the Gentiles okay so that's the period of time for which he says Jerusalem would be as he uses the phrase trampled uh, by the Gentiles what Jesus is saying is there will be the fixed time period in which the Gentiles are allowed to have ownership of Jerusalem and the city and the tabernacle um, but that will be for a fixed time so what is that time of the Gentiles well to try and answer that I think we need to go to an Old Testament prophecy uh, in the book of Daniel. If you come with me to Daniel chapter 8, please, and we'll see what, <coughs> uh, what this prophet had to say. Now, Daniel recorded his dreams that he had. Now, in this dream in Daniel chapter 8, he sees two animals fighting. And let's just look at verses 
3 through to 7. So this is Daniel uh, talking about what he sees in his dream. I lifted up my eyes and saw, and there standing beside the river was a ram which had two horns. And the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher one came up last. I saw the ram pushing westward, northward, southward, so that no animal could withstand him, nor was there any that could deliver from his hand. But he did according to his will and became great. And as I was considering, suddenly a male goat came from the west across the surface of the whole earth without touching the ground. And the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. Then he came to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen standing beside the river, and ran at him with furious power. I saw him confronting the ram, and he was mocked with rage against him, attacked the ram, broke his two horns. There was no power in the ram to withstand him, but he cast him down to the ground and trampled him, and there was no one that could deliver the ram from his hand. Okay, so that's, that's Daniel's dream. Uh, he sees this, this ram, and he sees this goat coming, attacking the ram, and overpowering him. Now, fortunately for us, um, an angel speaks to Daniel and explains to Daniel what this dream means. So if you go down to verse 20, the angel explains to him uh, that the ram which you saw, that was the first animal, having two horns, they are the kings of Media and Persia. And the male goat is the kingdom of Greece. The large horn that is between its eyes is the first king. So what Daniel's dream means then, we're being told, is that it's talking about the time when the Medo-Persian and the Persian Empire will be overthrown by the Greeks. Okay, so that's what he's talking about. Well, what's the significance to what we're talking about here? Well, if you go to verse 13 and 14, I think you see why this is significant. Verse 13, Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to that certain one who was speaking, How long will the vision be? concerning the daily sacrifices and the transgression of desolation and giving of both the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot. And he said to me, for 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. <clears throat> so you can see there quite a lot of similarities to the, some of the phrases Jesus was using, can't you? About the sanctuary being trampled underfoot uh, by Gentiles. In his dream, he's told that uh, in the sort of, of his dream, that would be 2,300 days later. Now, we know from elsewhere in, in the dreams of Daniel that one day in his dream equates to one year in prophecy. So, <clears throat> so we can do some sums, can't we? <coughs> so we've been told there's uh, 2,300 years uh, between that battle. So when the Persian Empire is overthrown by the Greeks, from that, there will be 2,300 years. And at that point, uh, the tabernacle will no longer be trampled by Gentiles. So let's do our sum. So to start that sum, we need to know when the Persian Empire was overthrown by the Greeks. Now, like most people, perhaps, these days, I turn to Wikipedia. Uh, you might not be able to see this. Uh, it's a little bit small on the screen. Uh, Wikipedia says this. The Battle of Issus occurred in southern Antalonia in November 333 BC. The invading troops led by Alexander, Alexander, of course, as, as we all know, was the, was the famous Greek commander. Um, <clears throat> they were outnumbered more than two to one, yet they defeated the army personally led by Darius III of Persia. The battle was a decisive Macedonian victory, and it marked the beginning of the end of Persian power. So according to Wikipedia, the, the point at which the Persian power was overthrown was 333 BC. So that's the, the, the point we have in Daniel's prophecy. So let's do our sum. So 333, and remembering, of course, that, that BC was negative. So 333 BC, we add on the 2,300 years of Daniel's dream, and we get to 1967 AD. So what was special about 1967? Well, 1967 was the, the year that saw what became known as the Six-Day War. Um, now, to understand what happened, I need to give you a little bit of uh, explanation to how the land was divided after the Second World War. So, after the Second World War, the, the Jews were given a land to own as their own, which is marked by this orange here. And note, there's like this big bite taken out the side of, of the land they're given. This, is, this, is, this was given to Jordan, this area around here. 
Now Jerusalem, as you can see, is on that kind of that nose sticking into that area that's bitten out. So there's Jerusalem. Now, if we zoom in a bit more into Jerusalem, this orange line is, is that line round here, showing the border of the land that Israel was given after the Second World War. Okay? And here's Jerusalem. Now, remember I said when we were talking about David that what was very significant was the original city, the old city, the city of Jabus, the city of David. That's this bit marked here, you know, it just sees the old city. But the significant point is the border of the land that they were given cuts out the old city. So when they were given their land in 1949, they were not given the old city of David. That was it given uh, to the Jordanians. Okay. So what about 1967? Now I've got a video I'd like to play for you here. Um, <coughs> it came from a, a, a brilliant documentary made by the BBC um, called The 50 Years War. And in this documentary they looked at all the battles going on in, in Israel and, and how, how they had fed. I'm going to play you a short extract when they talk about the Six Day War in 1967. Now, what just, they've just been explaining, in this documentary, that they've spoken to everyone involved and they, they have very candid discussions about what happened. They spoke to the Egyptian rulers, the Egyptian army, they speak to the Jordanian army and the Jordanian king. Uh, they speak to uh, the Israeli rulers at the time and their army. And they talk to the Russians. And they're all very <coughs> candid about what happened. And what I hadn't realised until I heard this documentary was the involvement in the Russians. And they deliberately sparked the Six Day War. And they speak to the, to the Russians involved who, who quite honestly and openly say, well, it was all because of what was happening in Vietnam. And they were, they thought, the Russians thought that the Americans were losing their grip on Vietnam. And they wanted to push home, the Russians wanted to push home that advantage. And they thought, what better way to do that than to distract the Americans from Vietnam. And to do that, let's spark trouble in the Middle East. And what they did was they, they sent ambassadors to Egypt, and they all admit this openly on this, on this documentary. They sent them down to, to Egypt and said, did you know that the Israelis are mustering all their troops and their tanks on the Syrian border. They're about to invade Syria. So the Egyptians send up their reconnaissance to the border and they come back and say, well, no, there's no sign of any Israeli army on the border with Syria. The Russians come back to them and say, oh, absolutely, they are. They're definitely about to invade Syria. And they started rumours in the whole of the Middle East saying Israel is about to attack Syria. In the end, the Egyptians say they felt they had no choice but to go and fight against Israel because of what they were being told. Israel saw what was happening and said, well, we've got to make the first strike, otherwise we'll be wiped out. And um, they send their air force across and they totally wipe out the Egyptian air force uh, before the Egyptian air force can take off from the ground at all. Now, and so exactly as Daniel had prophesied many years before, Israel then takes possession of the old city of Jerusalem and the time of the Gentiles had ceased. There's also other prophecies that talk about what will happen at Jerusalem in the future, and we'll look at a couple of those now. In Zechariah chapter 14, uh, we look uh, towards the future now, about another great battle. So we saw there uh, one great battle actually taking place. Zechariah 14, uh, we're told that another one will happen at the return of Jesus, again centred round Jerusalem. So, could we read please, Zechariah chapter 14. Zechariah 14. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. And I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth, and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle, and his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west, and there shall be a great valley, and half of the mountain shall, shall remove toward the north, and half of it toward the south. And ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Azal. 
yea, you shall flee. Like as ye fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. And the Lord my God shall come, and all the saints with me, with thee. And it shall come to pass in that day that the light shall not be clear nor dark, but it shall be one day which shall be known to the Lord, not day not night, nor night, but it shall come to pass that at evening time it shall be light. And it shall be in that day that living waters shall go out from Jerusalem, half of them toward the former sea and half of them toward the hinder sea, in summer and in winter shall it be. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day there will be one Lord, and his name one. All the land shall be turned as the plain from Geba to Rimon south of Jerusalem, and it shall be lifted up and inhabited in her place. From Benjamin's gate unto the place of the first gate, unto the corner gate, and from the tower of Hananiel unto the king's wine presses. And men shall dwell in it, and there shall be no more utter destruction, but Jerusalem shall be safely inhabited. And this shall be the plague, wherewith the Lord will smite all the people that have fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet, and their eyes shall consume away in their holes, and their tongues shall consume away in their mouth. And it shall come to pass in that day that a great tumult from the Lord shall be among them, and they shall lay hold every one on the hand of his neighbour, and his hand shall rise up against the hand of his neighbour. And Judah also shall fight at Jerusalem, and the wealth of all the heathen round about shall be gathered together, gold and silver and apparel in great abundance. And so shall be the plague of the horse and of the mule, and of the camel and of the ass, and of all the beasts that shall be in these tents, as this plague. And it shall come to pass that every one that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feast of the tabernacles. And it shall be that whosoever will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. And if the family of Egypt go not up and come not, that have no rain, there shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite the heathen that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all nations that come not up to keep the Feast of the Tabernacles. In that day there shall be upon the bells of the horses holiness unto the Lord, and the pots of the Lord's house shall be like the bowls before the altar. Yea, every pot in Jerusalem and in Judah shall be holiness unto the Lord of hosts, and all they that sacrifice shall come and take of them, and seed therein, and in that day there shall be no more the Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts. There's also a prophecy in the book of Joel which very much covers the same sort of events. I've got a few bits of that on the screen here for you. The prophet Joel said, Assemble and come all you nations, prepare for war to the valley of Jehoshaphat. The day of the Lord is near, the sun and moon will grow dark. The Lord shall roar from Jerusalem, the heavens and earth shall shake. But the Lord will be a shelter. So you shall know that I am the Lord your God, dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. Then Jerusalem shall be holy, and no stranger shall pass through her again. So if you put those two prophecies together, um, these are some of the, the pictures we see of, of what will happen when Christ returns. There will be another large battle in the, in the future, centred again on Jerusalem. And we're told that this time Jerusalem will be largely overthrown. But at that point, God will intervene and Jesus will return to the Mount of Olives. We're also told there'll be a great earthquake and there'll be great confusion in the, among the attacking armies so much confusion, in fact, that we're told they end up fighting each other and are therefore all overthrown. And the conclusion is that God will be worshipped from Jerusalem. So that's the, the picture we have of, of what is going to be happening shortly. Now I'd just like to um, just spend a moment just dwelling on the, on the fourth point there um, about this great earthquake 
uh, that will take place. And I want to do that simply because I was very interested by an article um, I saw some years ago by NBC News entitled Jerusalem's Old City at Risk of Earthquake. Uh, and what they, what they say there is that some Israeli scientists have warned that another major earthquake appears likely to strike the Holy Land in the next 50 years. Now, this, they explain the reason. The Great Rift Valley runs for 3,000 miles between Syria and Mozambique and passes through the Dead Sea below Jerusalem's eastern walls. The fault line was caused by the separation of African and Eurasian tectonic plates 35 million years ago, a split that weakened the Earth's crust. About 35 miles to the north, another fault line cuts the land east to west from the Mediterranean port of Haffa with the west bank towns of Jenin and Nebulus before reaching the Jordan River. This is a very active area which may produce a large earthquake once in a while, be unsaid. Okay, so the scientists are warning in about, well, that was what, 15 years ago, 13 years ago, uh, there will be an earthquake, they said then, in about 50 years, they were predicting. Uh, so what they were talking about in the tectonic plates uh, was this. So we have the uh, Arabian plate here, a Eurasian plate moving that way, uh, and the African plate moving up. So you see that it's twisting and pulling the land apart round here. And this is Jerusalem. There's another fault line running up here. Okay, so that's what they're talking about. Those plates moving, ripping the land apart in that point. Now, if you zoom in a bit, if you look at a, a relief map of the area on, on the right, uh, this is the Jordan Valley. You can just see from looking down on it how the land is being ripped apart uh, along this area here as, as those plates move. Now, if you zoom in again a bit more on the left, now, this is the area around the Dead Sea. This is the Dead Sea Basin that's formed because of the land pulling apart. And that's what forms that Dead Sea Basin. If you look at where Jerusalem is, it, it's right on the edge of this area here where it's being pulled apart. And these little crosses are the sort of fold lines in, in the land. So what those scientists are saying, with all these fold lines here on Jerusalem, right around here, um, that this is an area that's going to see a large earthquake. And their feeling was, from what they've been looking at, that the plates were about to go like that again, which will cause a big uh, earthquake. And I thought that was, that was interesting, bearing in mind what we've seen in those prophecies about uh, an earthquake in the land in, in Jerusalem at the time of Christ's return. I thought it was interesting to, to, uh, to see that scientists are predicting the same sort of thing. But beyond all that, beyond the great earthquake, beyond the bloodshed and the battle and all the horrific things we're going to be told will take place at that time, we're also told Jerusalem will have a glorious future. I put some quotes here mainly from Isaiah. Isaiah 62. For Zion's sake I will not hold my peace. For Jerusalem's sake I will not rest until her righteousness goes forth as brightness and her salvation as a lamp that burns. One from Ezekiel. The name of the city from that day should be the Lord is there. Isaiah 62 again. Give him no rest until he establishes, until he makes Jerusalem a praise in the earth. And Isaiah 35. The ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing, with everlasting joy on their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. So what we're being told is that beyond the, the bloodshed and the battle, the time will come when there will be everlasting joy in Jerusalem, when there will be no more sorrow or sighing, but instead there will be joy and gladness. It's a glorious future that we're told Jerusalem will look forward to. Because, as we said early on, because God has this special relationship with this city. Now let me just end by pointing out that this isn't just what's happening to a foreign city a thousand miles away, but it's something that's going to impact every one of us in the future. Let me take you back to some words of Jesus. This is, comes just after what Jesus said when we put up on the screen about the, the, the time Jerusalem was first be taken. He went on from that to say that they will see the Son of Man coming in the cloud with power and great glory. Now when you see these things begin to happen, look up, lift up your heads, because your redemption draws near. 
So do you see how now this is suddenly becoming a personal message, isn't it? Something that we should be reacting to, right? Lift up your heads, he says, because your redemption draws nigh. Your redemption, your salvation. It suddenly becomes something very personal to each one of us. Because these world-changing events that will take place at Jerusalem, as we've seen, will roll out to encompass the whole world and will impact every person. And so we need to take action in our lives now so that when those things do happen, we will be ready for them. And that's the sort of topics that are often covered from this platform.